Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edutainment podcast on Cape Conscious Media. Uh, today in the studio, we have, we, we're blessed to have uh, Roscoe Palm. Uh, he is the director of PAYS, the Pan African uh, Institute. Of socialism. For socialism. For socialism. I got the full acronym. And besides that, he's a, yeah, he just does a lot of everything. I remember uh, we just spoke about this a bit earlier growing up. I actually, Roscoe was my neighbor. Like a little, like a, like a big brother figure because always like chilled out, cool, super relaxed, but very informative. And yeah, it's a pleasure to have a, a neighbor, a friend and someone who's, you know, doing beautiful things uh, on the show. Welcome. Thank you. It, you know, it's nice to see uh, a bra that you know <laughs> from the from the wood in the rivers do well, and you're doing good stuff, man. So, you know, I'm blessed to be here. You know? Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, yes, man. Yes. Great, great. Yeah. So, tell us a bit about you before we start and go into all that you're doing. Like, get the uh, who's Roscoe? Well, okay. Besides being uh, the guy who used to be Chaz's neighbor, um, <laughs> I'm the director of the Pan African Institute for Socialism. Um, so, you know, there, there are two things. There are two elements to that. There's the the Pan African aspect, which means, or well, Pan Africanism is basically a um, philosophy that says, or rather, um, not so much a philosophy, but a uh, um, a position that says we as Africans have more in common. Um, then we have that separates us. So we have to work together politically, economically to effectively further and defend our sovereignty mm. as Africans. Mm, mm, and mm. that includes people in the diaspora, um, whether you are um, of African descent in Britain or of African descent in the Caribbean, you are African. Mm. Uh, and then um, to the socialism aspect is, well, I'm a socialist and I believe that uh, we need more um, socialism in this country and on the continent as a whole. Mm. We look at South America where there are governments that are, many governments are now socialist governments and that's uh, because there's a need in the global south, you know, like um, uh, the countries in South America and Africa and, you know, um, Asian countries um, to uh, provide more for ordinary people in a way that capitalism cannot, will not. Mm -mm. When people say socialism, they become a bit, you know, scared because we, you know, we're still very Western and we have that sort of Western mentality and our whole system is very Western with regards to, um, you know, make as much as you can. Mm. It has that sort of gedachte and, mm. um, you know, when you hear the term socialism, it's like it needs to be equal for everyone. And then people say, yeah, but it's equal for everyone, but that person doesn't deserve because they don't work as hard or, yes. you know, so is, is socialism for you the opposite? Is it anti-capitalism or does socialism have a role to play? Can it be beside capitalism? Can we just get into that? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, you know, people get in, people over intellectualize all these things. And that's what drives people, ordinary people away from politics. Um, and if ordinary people are driven away from politics, it's left to like these elite people who can control the narrative. So um, the, the story goes that Fidel Castro was explaining like to uh, at a mass meeting what socialism is. And he was going into the theory about like Marxism and like the markets and all these things. And he could see that he was losing, you know, the attention. And he said like, comrades, <laughs> do you want housing? I say, yeah. Do you want education? Say, yeah, yeah, sounds good. Do you want uh, um, health care? say, yeah. <laughs> then you want socialism. So I'm telling, I'm saying to everybody like these, the, you know, I don't want to get into the mud about like, what is a pure socialist, a communist, a capitalist, whatever. It's just things aren't really working mm. as, as the unemployment is rising. I, you know, even though the ANC, which I'm a member of, is a social democratic formation, it's not really implementing socialism as what it's supposed to have been, as, as what it um, initially aimed to do so. Mm -hmm. I think we live in a really unequal country, you know, mm -hmm. like um, there, there are things that are fundamentally broken about our country. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need more socialism, but we, not, we don't have to be um, 
one note about socialism to be heterodoxical I mean, you know there's some some elements of capitalism that work well you know we're not going to throw the baby out with the bath water um there's uh mao the chinese um the chinese uh president said like it doesn't matter what the color of the cat is if it's a black cat or a white cat or pink cat or purple cat the thing is can the cat catch mice so it doesn't matter if it's a socialist cat if it's a capitalist cat in many cases mm. um can can mm. the can the cat provide mm. for the people mm. Mm. so i also feel from what you said as well that if we are going to implement you know a more social um ideology and bring it into into policy um and into ideology and into our philosophy that it needs to be done by people who are good people who are not in a sense uh, uh hiding under the pretense of being socialist but filling their pockets and have a capitalist gedachte mm. how important is it for you know s- uh, socialist leaders number one and then number two um can we implement it in the current system and how fast can we do it and how do we do it without scaring people away Can you just like I don't know it's a very loaded question yes, no, but I just I like I want to get on top of it man <laughs> Yeah um look in in many ways um a lot of elements of our um our society is already socialist I mean we have a healthcare system which is you know it's, it's, you go to the day hospital you um are seen to okay sometimes a little bit slower you get to the medicine that's free um and this is a uh, socialism The element that we need to um really pursue about socialism is equality and the commons. Mm. So equality means things like um all are equal before the law. Mm. You can't have a situation where uh you know like if you you if you steal 20 rand or a loaf of bread you're going to mm. go sit in the mung for like 20 years. Mm. Whereas the guys like um the stein of guys steals billions he's never going to see the inside of a courtroom never mind the inside of a jail. He got a fine of 160 million for um contravening the insider trading trading act. That was 4 years ago. He appealed the act was uh, the, the fine was reduced to 20 million which he can take out of his ticket pocket. So we don't we have a vastly unequal experience of the justice system um even when it comes to like gender based violence when it comes to every single aspect of society. You go to the other side of the rail one side of the railway line things work nice you go to the other side the wrong side of the railway line mm. um it's things don't quite work mm. yeah. it's so it's so interesting to talk about the railway line as well sorry just to talk about the railway line we literally live we we come from the railway line yeah. we on the burgfleet is the other side yeah and you just go over the rail we can see those houses there and it's burgfleet it's mm. still like it's it's you know um yeah it's burgfleet and then outside is somerset park and then you go to the back of us just further up the railway line and it's in Lake a sense it's lake view and retreat yeah. so in a not even 500 meter radius mm. you know on the railway line there's three different demographics it's uh, south africa is a very you know it's very interesting is that and that's that's structural apartheid mm. people say that that apartheid is, is done it's it's not done just look at what's what's on either side of the mm. m5 Mm. What's on either side of the railway line? What's on either side of the railway stations? Mm. Um what's uh, the beaches that 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 colored people go to? Mm. It's different to the beaches that white Okay, yeah, you can go to Clifton, but like actually, you know, your brass is going to go to um to Sunrise mm. actually mm. most mm. of the time, you know. Mm. So that that structural apartheid is still there. Mm. It's like it's it's in the railway lines, but also the railway lines inside of our um our minds. Mines. So, you know, like apartheid is very much like a a construct that's constantly being reinforced by the psychology of um the oppressed actually. Mm, mm, mm. And if you don't think that uh, colored people, black people are oppressed, that we are being uh pauperized, mm, that uh, mm, mm. you know, that that non-white people are being pauperized, that um things uh are, life gets harder and harder and harder for uh, non-white people all the time, then uh, you know you 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 living in a, a fantasy land mm. or you living in like you know on the atlantic seaboard maybe mm. um we're just going to go to the comments quickly so we have adrian kerns hey adrian thanks so much for tuning in uh, he says no full blown ideology but it's just impossible because of globalization any comment on that it's true um i think that you know the, the liberal way of doing things how we perceive things um it's um ever since 1990 when at the fall of the berlin wall we became 
um, coach, like communism had lost. You know, the, the, the Russia had been Soviet the, Union. The Soviet Union had mm. been broken up, um, and it, um, it was the end of history, so to speak. And now there's a, a liberal hegemony, and you can see it in the way that, like, um, the the media treats certain aspects. Like, for mm. example, this World Cup, all of the things that you read in the Guardians are all about, like, wow, look at all these Qatar workers, like they're dying and whatever. It's, it's a disgrace. They should protest. They should wear this. Look at the oppression, whatever. You will never see that in the World Cup 2026 where Guantan- Guantanamo Bay is still open. They're torturing prisoners that they arrested in uh, Afghanistan, in Iraq. Um, in an illegal war, in an illegal occupation, mm. under any international statute, you are never going to see. It. But because liberals say it, mm. because the the, the 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 when he says global globalization, he means like the liberal hegemony when when this mm. Adrian, um, and it's true. But now instead of one power being the dominant power, America and Europe, we're seeing. Uh, China, China rising, China having. Uh, China was thirty five years ago the 11th poorest country in the world mm. per capita. Now it's the second wealthiest country and it will overtake the United States. Very soon. Europe is in um, a complete, complete mess. Uh, Africa is becoming more and more sovereign. The other day, a Central African country bought um, uh, 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 military helicopters, not from America, they bought them from Russia. America got kicked out, is getting kicked out of East Africa, even though they have the largest uh, military base in East Africa, the AFRICOM um, in, in, in the Horn of Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, so the world is changing. This globalization that Adrian talks about, it's slowly being chipped away because of the ineptitude of um, America, because it's just, it's just not working. The inequality is becoming more and more. Uh, among um, nations in the in in the global south, or between nations in the global south and um, America, and we are making better trade deals with each other rather than only having to rely on America and Europe. Mm, 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 mm. So, yeah. I got you. And uh, with regards to, to to South Africa, what is the current state of South Africa? What does what are some of the the, the, the top issues? that we're going through currently that need to be resolved immediately. Early on, you spoke about, you know, the apartheid legacy and something that I see, you know, besides the, the socioeconomic and the, um, you know, you know the, the geographical element of it, you know, the railway one side mm. on the other side, the education system, that is something that in a sense bothers me because if I look at the current education system, it does not, you know, prepare our kids, especially um, our our black and colored kids, for the real world, it no, doesn't give them uh, you know opportunity. Um, and yeah, like, what, what, what's your take on the education system? Look, the, the the education system it's 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 not it's not what it's supposed to be. But I think the, the most pressing pressing issue, the one that came to mind, we said, what is the thing? It's right in front of all of us, and it's it's load shedding. Yeah, like this this thing is now getting to the stage where. Um, you, you can't. Um, uh, you, we're losing one billion uh, rand per day per stage. So today, as we're sitting here, it's uh, stage five. We've lost five billion rand today. You woke up at like say seven, eight o'clock in the morning. Now it's uh, it's nine. Five billion rand just phew, gone, mm. just like that. Mm. Um, and um, you know the the cost of 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 not building capacity, of not looking at um, energy sources, at at, uh, um, uh, at at to that will fuel the economic growth. It's like the, uh, we we really are falling off the cliff with load shedding, mm, mm. and I think politically that's gonna that is going to manifest in the ANC um, potentially losing power in twenty twenty four. And who would they lose power to? Well, fewer people are voting. Okay. So um, the people are becoming less enthused by the democratic uh, project. Mm. So if you have uh, fewer people turning out, um, if, if in a low turnout election, um, the ANC suffers. The DA managed to bring out its voters, like very enthusiastic voters. The EFF manages to bring out its voters, um, but enthusiasm for ANC uh, support in a low turnout election, um, it's very low. 
So they're not going to lose to a particular party. There's no ways, whatever any DA person tells you, that they're going to take um, 50%, 30%, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. But you would have um, uh, potentially a, a coalition of the, the DA gets 20%, the um, EFF gets 10%, whatever. They'll just chip away at the ANC. And all of these parties... Um, will forget about their first principles when the prospect of taking power, punishing the ANC, when that, like the, 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 the DA said, we will never work with uh, the EFF. Mm. They got into a coalition in uh, 2016 uh, against, against the ANC. Mm. Um, so what we have in municipalities where there's a coalition in Nelson Mandela Bay and um, Johannesburg and wherever there's, there's a coalition, it's done um, with the express purpose of punishing the ANC. Mm. Uh, so it will be an unstable coalition. None of these coalitions are stable. So, so, so what we're saying is that when, we, when they're going to get into a coalition and they punish the ANC, that it obviously doesn't benefit the people. Because what is the, what's the mandate you know, for those in government is to, make, to be clear-headed, to make uh, decisions that's going to benefit the people, the economy, um, mm. that we can rebuild, that there's some form of Ubuntu togetherness that we can move forward. But mm. what does the, what does the, poli- the, the current political landscape look like? Is, is, is coalition, let, let's, let's put it this way as well. People say, okay, there is coalition now. There is a challenge to the ANC. So that's a good thing. Is it a good thing? Because if I look at parliament, I don't even know, I can't watch parliament anymore. Okay, uh, there, there is a certain level of ignorance here because I'm also kind of hutful about politics, so I don't like put, I don't fully pay attention to it. But when I do, it's it's point of order. It's trying to get on each other's nerves, man. Yeah, and uh, it just doesn't feel right. I went to I went to this uh, to watch um, uh, the Mark Lothring show, Auntie Merle. Yes, things get real. I saw it. It's, it's amazing. Everybody should watch it, and. Um, there was one point, uh, okay, spoiler alert in case you want to go watch uh, Auntie Mill. There's one point where this uh, kid gives a, well, one of the, he's a, the child in the cast as the, as the child. He gives a soliloquy about like, um, look here, my friend is on drugs and this thing. Is like, la, 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 la. And then he goes, fuck this government. I then he said, fuck the government or fuck this government. He said, fuck the government. And then the audience, there was this like, consensus in the audience mm. you know even me i have this consensus was, as well but i'm also thinking yeah what about the audience but you yeah. kind of feel like a no man so no <laughs> because because we're in cape town yes. uh, we're in cape town so it's this is the majority of the people in the audience would be probably da or you know they not anc people they would equate the government with being the ANC, so it will be Cyril Ramaphosa, and it will be the cabinet, and it will be the ANC that has the lodger. All of these problems that are attached to the government is being seen as the ANC. So this, the stage play takes place in um, uh, Athlone. You know that that's the that that's the setting for these characters. They live in Athlone, Auntie Merle and 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 the family, which is the DA ward, mm. which uh, um, uh, is in the city of Cape Town, a DA city. In uh, the Western Cape, which is the DA province. So the government, like, okay, well, what government? And the, the, the overwhelming um, uh, sentiment is all governments, actually. Because mm. the, there is a, the, the four weaknesses of governments, whether you ANC, DA, EFF, Democratic Party in the, the, the states, whatever, there the, are the four weaknesses that will lead to the inevitable decline of any government. Number one is mental slackness. See if you can identify mm. this, uh, uh, make a checklist mm. of mm. Your, mm. your ward councillor, your provincial, whatever. Mental slackness. Mm. Like you're just not improving yourself, improving um, your own mental capacity and understanding of what you need to do. Number one. Mm. Number two, corruption. Mm. Come on, you know. Number three would be um, uh, distance from the masses. I mean, and we look at every, like the governments are so completely distant from the masses that uh, they may, may as well be sp- uh, speaking a completely different language. <laughs> um, and um, number four is uh, incompetence. So, you know, like somebody will just not know how to do a job, so it, it just won't be done. Um, and there is no political party as exists in in the current uh, uh, the current iteration 
or that that I can constantly that I can uh, say has the potential to renew itself to mm. to engage in a process of like self revolution mm. so that they can combat these mm. things it's very weird as well because you represent you are a member of the nc yes but at the same time you sound very fair across all the different political parties in your skepticism and in your in your observation yeah, i'm a member normally people can't you know if you are a member of a party there's this is misconception that you're not allowed to have your own observation Mm. And I'm, I, from from what I feel, it feels like you you're speaking on behalf of of the people, but you still are an ANC member. So how do, it's 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 interesting, beautiful, but at the same time, I'm thinking, but aren't you then speaking against your your Mensa? I'm not speaking against my Mensa. I'm yeah. speaking for for them, myself, and maybe if somebody agrees with me, that's fine. But you know, within the ANC, there's a tradition of uh, being able to dissent and critique. and um be respected for that dissent and critique as long as it's done respectfully as long as it's done you know in a comradely fashion mm, you know mm. um i know that in the da if you say one thing wrong about alan zilla like you gone <laughs> forget about it pack your bags you must line um but you know like i i, I don't i don't think that you know me making an analysis of like the the anc is going to manifest weaknesses that don't exist. Mm. You know, like I'm I'm just uh, many many comrades feel this way. Many comrades feel that the ANC has become distant from the ma- from the masses. Mm. And I think one of the most important things is we we seeing people being driven away from politics um when they should be in politics. Mm. Um from, from the, the traditions of the ANC in the Western Cape are strong and 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 we we losing that. We we've lost it actually. Mm. Like yeah. I remember growing up sorry to break you but I remember growing up my grandmother she was um all the meetings that were held in the Strandfontein area Mitchell Spain as well were, was held at my grandmother's house mm-hmm. so I, I grew up Tokyo Sikwale um a lot of you know the comrades were there I can't remember all the names now mm-hmm. um and we used to campaign we used to sing stamp your boda lam mm-hmm. and uh Yeah, it was a different time. My grandmother, it's very very sad to see you know to talk about politics to her. Mm. It's like you know she loves the ANC and she loves you know what they stood for. Yeah. But now today it's like a lot of people just kind of in a sense lost hope. Do you think it's that they lost hope in ANC or do you think it was unreasonable for people to have that expectation that they were going to deliver in the 24 years up until today? So or, you know, I, I don't know if, if that's a question or if it's an observation, but the feel, yeah. man, the feel's real. Yeah, you know what? What makes you? Because you, you do have you, you're not very you you're not very one sided. I can feel in a sense. I do sense that you kind of you open. So then, give me the reasons why you are an ANC member. Just so for us to see, you know, what attracts you to them. Look, I'm I'm um, I'm an ANC member. because i think that only the anc can actually deliver a uh, a socialist project okay and if if the anc is unable to do that it's going to be 30 30 years 30 40 years until another movement coalesces around a set of values and principles mm. that can deliver a socialist project mm. um that can change the lives of all people mm. all people mm. black white colored indian um immigrant whatever english afrikaans mm. um whatever language mm. culture creed um and it is a the, i i don't want to be the last generation of anc member but i'm looking at where are the 20 year olds the 20 who want to join the anc that they, they just they don't exist but what is the reason though man that's what i'm asking you can you give me a couple of reasons okay what, what from what i from what i can hear there's definitely some policy and there's definitely a history and there's definitely still a lot of people in the party that are still standing for the fundamental principles the only issue is those that are in power they're not really implementing yeah and maybe it's not the right people for the job if you look at the age a lot of them are super old you also spoke about one of the the four different uh, things that we need to keep an eye on one of them being like the men- the mental capacity and mm. like, they're not there man and also they are they outdates they don't know how to use technology 
they, they, they're not upskilling. They're yes. not tuned into what's happening around the world. I mean, if we speak AI to most of these guys, they won't know what we're talking about. Yeah. So they're not, they're not relevant. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm making, you know. No, you, you're not. You, you're actually hitting the nail on the head because there are a lot of people in any political party. I mean, Helen Zeller's what? She's like 70 or something yeah. like that. She's been, you know, the, the story of Helen Zeller is that she was just jolted by the ANC. So she said like, I'm, I'm leaving the ANC. I'm, I'm joining the DP. So she joined the DP and she's like vowed to destroy the ANC. So good for her. That's a sort of like a, a revenge story ultimately. But like the, the, there are a lot of old people in politics who are just, you have to like, you, they don't hand over the torch. They're going to, they want to, they want to die with that torch. Like just like gripped in there, like cold bony hands. And that torch, that flame will, 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 um, will, uh, expire if they do that. Or burn them. Yeah, exactly. So you look at the ANC in the 1980s. You had like Anton Franz, who was like 20 years old. Like the, he was a commander in Koto mm. Um, they, like he, um, uh, uh, trained, um, to defeat the apartheid government. And, um, when the security police, um, finally got hold of him in, in Athlone, mm. um, they, they wanted to kill him. 40 cops, uh, like a, an army of cops came to Athlone. This the Battle of Athlone. You can look it up. From midnight until 8 o'clock in the morning, that 20-year-old oh. took his AK and his handgun, and he, he said, they, 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 he wouldn't surrender. He said, Come on, me, you la fart. And he shot, he shot his way through that eight hours. Eventually, one of the cops lobbed the hand grenade into the, into the room, and, and, and he died. He died a year. He was 20 years old. 20 years old. Um, Ashley Creel as mm. well, 20 year old, 20 year old lighting, mm. like a, a speaker, a narrator, a thinker, a strategist, a political savant, mm. um, a dangerous person to the apartheid regime, mm. which had all the power, all the resources, all the backing of the United States and uh, all, all of that money. Apartheid police came into his house, handcuffed him, handcuffed him, shot him, 20 years old. So, Youth shouldn't be put off by the fact that there's some old bra saying, no, you must wait your turn. You must take it. So, must. so what would youth of today, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, what do we do outside of the political sphere to make that difference? Does it have to go through politics? Because through politics, it also it has that, that misconception, there's that ignorance, but then also there's that reality of what has happened. It's, it kind of has that sad story that's not realistically going to attract him. Mm. So my question is, what can we do? What can that 19-year-old, 20-year-old, 21-year-old, how do we mobilize them, number one, to get that energy up? And then how do they, how do they become the next Ashley Creels? Well, hopefully, you know, like not become the next martyr because the, the reason why Ashley Creel died and Anton French died is so that the, the youth can live and, and thrive in, in South Africa that... And a, and a Western Cape that hasn't actually yet been realized, you know, mm. like definitely not. Mm. Um, I would say that more young people need to be, in, need to actively involve themselves in politics. Mm. I just think that this, this, this whole thing about, um, like I can, if, if I could work, if I work with youngster, mm. I can probably make him the mayor, youngster CPT really. Mm, mm, mm. Like he's, he's from OV, um, he's got swag, he's a writer. Isn't he from Grassy Park? But he's okay. in, he also stayed in OV. Oh, okay, okay. Or okay. oh, not like, Weinberg. Like, yeah. yeah. But the boomer. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's from here. And like, these are, these are people that like, um, that are following in, the, well, he, I don't, I'm not sure about his politics. Like, maybe he's a conservative. I don't know. Yeah. But like, I, I could, I've worked with, um, candidates like in, um, San Francisco, in Texas, in New York, in South Africa, like everywhere. Like, I know that he's got that connection with the masses that, um, ordinary politicians don't, that don't have mm. Patty Monroe could be the mayor of Cape Town. I, mm. I, you know, she's a friend of mine. I, I adore her as a person. Mm. Yeah. She's the um, cool girl with the, with the, with the short blonde she, she, she did some, short, she did some yeah. music videos and now she's quiet. She's yeah. amazing. But like, you know, like as quiet as music is, she's quiet as a person. Mm. Like, and there's, there's a lot of Emil XY from black noise, like yes. a real political heavyweight, grassy pop. Mm. 
Mm. Um, or people who have influence. Because I, when I hear that name, I I remember seeing him at the at the dome. What's the the civic center when they used to have yeah. their battle of the years? And they came to school. Uh, they got TVA crew to do a nice um, graffiti piece, and the graffiti piece said "Gebrek jou gedachte." Uh. So these people have that, yeah. you know, that that they still have that following or some sort of, mm. you know. But but in today's life, like what do we do with them now? Because youngster, for example, um, youngster is a rapper. Um, a lot of the lyrics, you know, we're not going to go into philosophy and lyrics and whatever else, but the influence is there. But how do we, um, besides just the, the influence, what language do we speak? How do we get these people to... Oh, look, I'm, I'm also assuming that they're not because I just don't like listening to music that has a specific message. Mm. Well, or look, maybe I'm not even listening closely, but you know what I mean? You're going to get that specific... He has, a, he has a persona. He has a target audience. How do we... Uh, the first thing I would say to if youngster wanted to run for mayor of Cape Town, it's like, don't make a rap about politics. Don't make your music political. Like, okay. Like, be the, you can be political, but you don't necessarily need to, like, make your art all around that thing. But anyways, look, I... I, I uh, if I had the answer for how like young people can mm. can be involved in um, in, uh, in politics, uh, or rather make making that difference. social change, yeah. um, the honest truth is I don't I don't know where mm. to start honestly. Because mm. mm. look, I'm 42. I've got I'm not a youth. There's a thing in in, in politics where youth is from um, 18 to 35. So that youth 42. League, yeah, look young, bro. Thanks. Thank you for the <laughs> kind compliment. But like, I'm, I'm, I'm in in politics. I'm young. In the real world, I'm actually really old. So um, this concept of political youth needs to be revised. Like the young young people, it's like between what, like sixteen and twenty one, and then I think you know youth league can stop. But it would be good for younger people to involve themselves more in being more outspoken, mm. actually, what, what I would say. Mm. We live this reality. Mm. So there's nothing stopping people from commenting on it and like observing it. And enough people do that. Mm. Earlier on, you wanted to speak about the importance of um, having a platform like this. And you said, Chad, I don't, mean, I don't want to talk about it now. I want to talk about it, you know, when we're doing the podcast. And I think it's the perfect time for that because I think you do know. I think mm. we know. Because we uh, we both identify the importance of a conscious media platform that allows people to speak like this. Yeah, exactly. You know, so, you know, with regards to media, what's the importance um, of media? And through media, do you think we can be that, that change? Because, I mean, I have this mic. I can reach out to thousands of people. Mm. We're obviously trying to get our listenership up and getting subscribers. But at any time... If someone wants to listen to us, they can, not just in Cape Town, but all around the world. Mm. And this is also one of the cheapest, I did research today because I'm doing the pitch deck for Cape Conscious Media. And this is also the, one of the cheapest media platforms. You don't need paper. You don't need huge data costs. You can, mm. you can do it with just audio. Um, and it's available. And, and it lasts it, forever. It lasts forever. It's timeless. So mm. what, what is your take on... Let's, let's try to hypothesize this now and see, you know, let's speak about the media space. Well, first of all, I got into a, a massive fight with the media. Okay. Um, I think it was about, um, I think four months ago, uh, when, uh, look, when, if you watch CNN and then they put up a, a thing that says like, um, uh, reports, Chad pees in the basin, you know? People are going to come to you and say like, Chad, yeah, Chad why, why are you peeing in the basin? You know, you're supposed <laughs> to, you know, it's like, it's like, it's not true just yeah. because it's on CNN what it yeah. doesn't mean it's true. But yeah. CNN has this institutional authority that mm. if they, the Chiron says like, Chad pees in the basin, it basically becomes a fact. Mm. So we have media um, publications in South Africa that have that institutional authority that if they say it, people go like, wow, geez, that, that must be true, you know? <laughs> so this thing, something came out in Amambungani, like about um, my organization, the Pan-African Institute for Socialism. Um, it, they briefly mentioned us, but ultimately that was about a few journalists um, who wanted to, who have an anti-worker, and anti-labor union, or a particular labor union, um, NUMSA, um, that wanted to uh, platform their grievances their biases and frankly their outright lies in this thing that say, that basically 
says that we are controlled by China, funded by China, that there's a nefarious plot um, that we are part of to, you know, like um, to um, control a media narrative. And it was just like that when they, they say things about you, that you in the room, you know, that's just simply not true. You know, mm. you go like, but look at this fucking cuck. You know, so like we, we, they, we said like, actually, you know what, we're going to investigate you. So what we found that like all of these people that, the, that, um, uh, uh, Amon Bungani, Mail and Guardian, uh, Daily Maverick are not honest about their funding. Um, I'm a, uh, Mail and Guardian in particular, they were, they ran out of money. They were, um, acquired through, um, uh, a, a shareholding that was uh, funded by um, CIA adjacent money. Mm -hmm. And all of these journalists then end up going to, like 19 journalists that end up going to, um, to work for CIA and uh, national endowment for democracy aligned um, institutions. Now the national endowment for democracy was a thing that was started that um, to do media influence. So um, they continue to do what this, Overtly, what the CIA couldn't do. So we found like the, a money trail of like people who work for these organizations, and they lied about like all of these things, their connections. Um, the problematic things are the U.S. state-funded institutions, like the National Endowment for Democracy, um, then private um, funding, like the George Soros Foundations and the Omid Yar Foundations. Um, they fund a lot of media projects in South Africa. Not they also fund uh, things like Africa Check. So um, they would train the journalists. They would own the publications. They would pay the journalists to write the stories, and then they would um, they would fund the fact checking organizations. Mm. So what you have is a a, um, a conveyor belt mm. of fabrication. They can dictate the agenda, and if needs be, they can just talk cock about people. They can mm. lie to you. Now, media funding is very difficult to come across, especially like if you've got like a, 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 a great organization like this. You really want it to be as independent as possible so that no one's yanking your chain and pulling your strings. And um, by uh, you, can't, you can't be told what you can say, what you can't say. Mm. Um, if you are funded by the, um, the National Endowment for Democracy or Open Society Foundations, you wouldn't necessarily be told that oh you can't you can't write the story about like mailing garden you can't have this guy on you would know because you want to apply for funding next year so you can't so you don't you'd rather like <laughs> no 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 let's rather let's rather have like somebody on because otherwise the funding's not there then it's obviously and it's, it's an issue yeah um and you know there's a lot of problems with the SABC you know mm. they, they, but one of the problems one of the problems they don't have is that they are objective. You know, they are, um, they, 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 they don't have a bias, a corporate bias. They don't, uh, have, um, an editorial policy that says like, look, no, don't, don't cover this. So we can't say that the ANC is because it's state owned. It's an SEO or SOE mm. that it has some sort of, it has some sort of alliance to the governing party. Can we say that? They get into trouble sometimes for uh, being um, the people in the in the ANC who expect the SA, uh, SABC to be a mouthpiece. Mm. And they're just not. They, they were at one stage. They really were mm. under, there was one guy, Claudio Mutsuneng, who like really wanted it to be a mouthpiece. Mm. Um, but they, they're actually, actually they're not. Independent media, especially in a, in a, in a there needs to be a, a diverse media escape. That includes you. I mean, you have to read things like Daily Maverick and Mail and Guardian because they're there. They have that institutional authority, but mm. then you also have to consume um, other bits of media. You have to to have a fair representation of both sides and to call out then the bullshit, right? It's you have to look w whether you make conscious decisions or whether you just consume what the algorithm feeds you. Mm. you you're going to um, you, you're going to be watching a lot more media sources these days than you were looking at two, three, five years ago. Mm, mm, mm. But it's very important to uh, that at least some of that media diet or that people are consuming is completely independent, mm. you know, like not beholden to anybody. So would you 
on record, I don't want to say that, but in your opinion, out of all the media publications, media houses, media organizations in South Africa, who is the most independent? In your opinion, based on the research or based on what you consume and just what you what you feel? It's tough, eh? I mean... Uh, is it, or, or do we say one as relative to the other? That they all have a certain level of bias, but one relative to the other, that's the safer source of news. It's, is, it, is it that sort of discussion that we... There's, there's no such thing. You, you know, you, you can't escape bias. Mm. We all have biases and prejudices. The thing that... The standard that you must aim for is fairness. Mm. So if you write 500 words, like talking shit about like um, Roscoe Palm, Mm. You, you, you must sort of also be fair in the way that you talk shit, okay. for example. You know, like back up your sources, actually. Mm-hmm. You know? And then also, are publications writing, do they have an agenda? Of course they have an agenda. And is the agenda because of who they're funded by? Not necessarily. The, yeah. the agenda generally tends to be, um, well, who they're funded by. Yeah. But the agenda of a media uh, company is to continue to exist it's uh, now the agenda of a media company is like how do how do we get our stories to the top of the feed? Like we have to get our stories to the top of the feed. We how, we need eyeballs on this article on this video. How do we SEO the shit out mm. of this so that we can monetize this so that we can live to write another day? That's it. And in some is cases, that a capitalist media, or do we need to socialize media? Because isn't that what media is? That the fundamental. Media, when I was in journalism class in my first year of journalism at CPUT, that was in 2000 and, sure, 2009, uh, one of the lecturers, and he was a media ethics lecturer, he said that journalism, or you as the journalist, you're the buffer between those in power and those that you have to serve. That sounds very, I mean, when, as soon as something becomes capitalized, you need to survive. And if you need to survive, you need to thrive because you need to compete. And if you need to compete, you need a budget, then it becomes this whole ball game. So besides the agenda and besides um, who's funding you, is media a business? And if it is a business, then is it media? Of course it's a business. Of course. Yeah, it's def- very definitely a business. So there was a time when, when I entered media and like uh, um, I was a media liaison, parliamentary media liaison in 2009. And, you know, like there, there were very different kinds of journalists then. You know, there were journalists that like wouldn't screw you over. You know, mm. you could take them into your confidence. You could, you know. Now there are more journalists that you can um, basically, if you write the story for them and just give it to them and you save them the, the, the trouble of like writing that copy by themselves, they're like, yeah, cool. Give it to they me. Will, yeah, that's fine. So give you can it angle it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's about those personal relationships. So not all journalists, mm. just that journalists don't have, they have, they, they, there was one journalist who could cover one beat and he had all the time to write quality, like to produce 2000 quality words a week. Mm. Now the journalist got to, got to produce like 800 a day, like for five days. And they got to compete against the other journalists. And mm. if they don't, if their things don't track, if the metrics don't, um, hit the journalist the right way if they mm. if people aren't looking at the copy they they done they're gone you know mm, mm, um mm. so it, yeah it's competitive and like in terms of um a media uh media uh, be having um more of a um uh, cooperative or like a, a more of a socialist model that's something that i would very definitely be interested in trying to build and, and be a part of because I do think that um, journalists and media has a, um, a, a very important role to play mm. in elevating other voices. Mm, mm. Yeah. So with regards to Cape Conscious Media, uh, something that we are trying to do is we don't only want to go through you know the funding route. We also want to, uh, we actually want to become an NPC, a non-profit company. Because we do believe that, um, you know, that we can produce quality content and get that content out and that's going to serve a purpose. And because it's serving a purpose, um, we believe that we deserve to be funded because of that, because we're going to reach out and we're going to do proper proposals and we're going to, you know, open up the platform for good voices that we feel is going to make a difference and we need support, mm. you know, especially CSI funding that's not being claimed. 
and people who have funding that want to make a difference, it can be done through media. But at the same time, I think it's very important as well that we don't um, solely depend on that, that we also have our own revenue streams. And that's why I like, you know, working with Nantel because he understands the importance of, of funding. I actually like spoke about that more than him, but he's he wants to also, he sees the, you know, the sustainability of it. He wants to take control of it. He wants to do something with it, you know. And, uh, you know, with regards to that concept, it makes me also feel like I'm not either side of the wing, mm -hmm. that I'm not Republican, nor am I uh, a Democrat, that I'm not socialist, nor am I capitalist. I kind of see I'll, Cape I'll Conscious I'll Media. To, I'm, yeah? I'm working on you. You will be a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> but can I be capitalist? Can I, can I have the positive attributes of capitalism? And can I work with the capitalists to fund the socialist projects? You and does it have to be us for them? So there's a very important misconception about socialism. Yes. That to be a socialist, you must be poor, mm. that you must give up material things, that you must wander the earth in sackcloth and sandals and never um, have any material comforts. Mm. Um, that's just not true. You know, like you can be a communist, but you can be a communist with capital as well. It's, uh, it's all about uh, the, the work that you do for with the it. masses. For the masses, you know. Like again, you know, if you want to be the the, the socialist that drives around in a Bugatti, you know, okay, there's an argument to be had that like it's excessive. Fuck you, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, but I think you know that as well. Yeah, um, <laughs> but um, you know, like the the leaders like um, Krasani, you know, Krasani, like the the leaders that eat first, and Krasani, like I'm told by his comrades, like he would first see that these men like used to used to eat first, and then and then he would eat. Um, I know a couple of leaders in the in the South African Communist Party. They they have they um have for, forgone a lot of their a lot of their um material comforts and they drive like just like the same cars that you and I drive, you know, mm. because why? Why must why must you drive a, a Bugatti? If you if there's some ministers who are communists that like demand only the best and have farms and a Krisani, Anton Franz, Ashley Creel, they would mm. look at them and they would be like actually you know mm. like what is this thing that that you became you know mm. um, but it's, you can have security and mm. be a socialist mm. i got you do you think also that through media because we always want a sensational story that that's what entices us our human nature that the two extremes always stick out and then we only sh talking or we only hear about the extremes of each other and then there's that misconception about the two that is now either the one or the other because the one extreme then points out at the other one. Yeah. So do you think that, you know, in the media landscape and us as human beings, that we have this hunger for sensationalism that leads to the extremes of everything? Yes. That gives us a whole distorted feel and creates separation. Yeah. Um, look, the, my favorite um, media in South Africa is also the most sensationalistic media mm. it's, a, it's daily a, voice it's a yeah daily voice and this one um See, they, Alice. You, and, and you can't you can't be snobbish about like the voice and this one because they actually tell the stories that's happening in people's lives and they sell the most copies out of any daily in south africa Massively. so it's a commercial success it's a it connects with people um, on on every level, mm. it's it's a it's, it's really a phenomenon, and mm. we must be proud of stuff like that. I'd rather read the Daily Voice than you know, the Daily Maverick. Really, mm. Mm. You know? I used to work for the Cape Times newspaper. It was my first job. I was an intern there. I worked there for a year. At that time, um, you know, newspaper or media as a whole has been going through a lot. And at that time, I mean, as an intern, I was given the responsibility, I don't know how that happened, but sometimes I was given the responsibility at 19 years old to write front page leads. Yeah. Which, and I was, and I was in the deep side of the ocean and I got it right sometimes because I was willing and I would go in and I was open and excited. But at the same time, I, I That's mean, like, like, I was why, are you, why are you handing me the keys to the thing? It's like, you know, you know, and there was this misconception that, you know, the daily voice, um, you know, it was, um, you know, weak journalism, that it was sensational, that the language that they used was rude, and that, um, yeah, it was, 
you know, I kind of also was standing on my high horse because I was coming from the Cape Flats and I'm now working for the Cape Times. So I think I yeah. also had that, you know, that ego. But looking back and based on what you said, I do agree, you know, that those are stories that actually really, really happen. But, you know, I still have that, 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 that problem, man, because if we were to send a journalist mm. into Constantia, or not even Constantia, into the suburbs, the leafy suburbs, to do a story, because these people think that these stories that happen in the Daily Voice don't happen in Constantia. It happens. Mm. It's just when you get to Constantia, they're not going to open the door and no one's going to speak to you. They'll have a family spokesperson. The police won't even allow you to speak to the sources. But yeah. if you go to Mitchell's Plain or Strandfontein or Bonteville and they shut the light in his head, you can go take a, you can go there. Yeah. It's open. There's, there's no, uh, you understand? Yeah. There's, there's, you know, uh, so, I mean, so that, 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 that's where I kind of felt like, nah, man, you know, mm. why are they showing that? Like, for example, if you look at colored movies, you name me the five colored movies, right? About mm. the Cape Flats. I promise you, four out of the five that you're going to name me, I can, I can name them. Dollars and White Pipes, Four Corners. Ellen Puckies. You understand? You tell me a positive story that took place on the Cape Flats. Where it was like, we, at, the, at the end of it, you took a deep breath and like, wow, you felt inspired. Nah, man, you know, the, it's, it's a reality. But it's not necessarily the most nicest reality, right? And that's not the only reality as well. So there's where I feel... Ah, you know, it's don't a bit tough for me. Sorry, guys, but don't you feel that uh, it, it, it feeds into the stereotype of the colored people? You know, the, the mm. stereotype of, of colored people is something that, you know, like we, we have to... Like, identity is a, is, is a very difficult thing. And when identity has been taken away from you, like so forcefully and violently, how do you, how do you actually reclaim that? Mm. So there's this thing about, like, um, where uh, uh, the colored people are gangsters and they have no front teeth. Okay, so... Let's look at like the at the teeth story. Do you, people know where that actually came from? And it's not blowjobs. This thing is com- comes from when um, uh, slave owners uh, treated um, their coloured slaves like cattle. They branded them and to denote ownership that this person, like you, Chad, are a slave. You you my slave. So I'm going to take out your teeth so that if you run away. I can know like okay now the brow the dreadlocks no not the okay he's with no teeth that that's my that's mm. my mm. property is it on record one of the one of the and theories or is it this real thing this, this is a this is a fact mm. and um so then the other slaves um uh people who, who were free in an act of defiance remove their Get own teeth, teeth. Re- remove the remove those teeth in solidarity with the, those oh, wow. uh, and that, as uh, you know, because the the, the traditional, um, the the oral tradition, the written tradition of um, uh, of many of the, the stories of slavery in 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 the Cape you know, in Cape Town, uh, it's not written down. It's mm. passed down by oral tradition. Oral tradition gets lost. Check it the Western media. I'm not going to say Western. I saw, I saw Wikipedia. They call it the passion gap, and that falls into that whole. That's the whole thing of the blowjob yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah so yeah. That, that's how you know how history gets sort of like. Like um, sexualized, ridiculed, and like the the most ridiculous, the most ridiculous things. Mm. Even now, to this day, like colored mm. people suffer, colored culture suffers. Before there was a thing where like you could have the, the have the the, the the menstrual carnival like in the in the middle of town. Now, because of politics, because of J P Smith, because of like a whole bunch of other things that they worried about this. Mm. Um, they, they worried about, they, 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 there's a distaste for the colored people. It's like, mm. yo, that, that gum there. Yeah. They must put the gum there in Fakie's crowd or there at Athlon Stadium, not by Greenpoint. Mm. So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a white supremacy that mm. comes into play in how, um, colored people are perceived. But is that a perception then that is, um, realized and, and, um, promoted by colored people? Because, there's a UCT study there. For many years, Cape Town residents had their upper front teeth extracted due to regional cultural fashion. A 2003 study performed by the University of Cape Town found that the main reasons for extracting teeth were fashion and peer pressure followed by gangsterism and medical purposes. Now, they're getting this information from colored people. So the issue is then that we don't know, because I didn't know the, I mean, I see myself as an educated man. I didn't know about but the... But why, why did it become a fashion? It became a fashion because in the days of slavery and colonialism, this was an act of solidarity. Nobody wrote it down. By the way, the Afrikaans language was, it was um, if you were, was invented by 
um, colored people. Yeah. If you, because Jan van Riebeek didn't come with Afrikaans on, on the boat. Mm, they, monument. They with, yeah, mm. they came with Dutch. So, um, Kombay's Afrikaans was developed from Dutch and, um, Khoisan and, you know, like Kosa mm. and like all these other languages and cultures. If you were caught speaking Afrikaans in the, in the, in the, in the house of a, of a white man, you were beaten in many instances. Mm. And now Afrikaans is a Steve Hoffmeyer, you know, white thing, you know. Mm. Um, it's okay. That's how cultures develop. But for in this thing, where it's like, why is it the, why is it the fashion? Who, what was the, the first domino to fall? And that was slavery. That was branding human beings. That was people who lost their identity, who lost their names. They came on the boat. You have the January, February, March, April, May, um, June's. Very few Julys mm. because it's it's really hard to land in the mm. Cape of Storms mm. in July. But mm. there are a few. August, August, September, October, November, December. Yeah. The identities were stripped away from mm. them. Mm. And then, when they when when going to a Model C school, mm. where in 1990 or whatever, your accent falls away magically. You know, mm. you, you begin to enunciate like a white person. Mm. You go, so but, you fit into that culture. But, but this is the thing again, is that in a sense. I always thought that you go into a white area now you get a white accent and you become white. Yeah, you keep but you actually, white. you you know, in a sense, you're keeping you white. But what I realized, you know, while growing up on the Cape Flats, it was actually a lot of the colored people, in a sense, that made being colored that made ham a problem. I found my I'm in the process of finding myself, and so are all of all of us. I know it sounds a bit dramatic. But I'm learning about, you know, my, my roots and culture. People think this is dreadlocks because of Rasta, partially because of black consciousness. But uh, uh, the dreadlocks is actually because of my Koi San heritage. It's actually just to leave myself alone. I don't have cruise hair. Mm-hmm. And if you think it's cruise because you're straight, then that's... I saw you when it was short. Though, yeah, so bro, you know what I mean? And now <laughs> it's coming out. My beard is out. I'm just, I am who I am. Mm. Just this is how I look. Mm. And, you know, before as well, um, you know... When you spoke with a, with a, with a, with a colored accent, that was kind of the more whiter you speak or don't speak that way. And if you were called a Bushman or we, when we spoke about Bushman, it's like it was lower than us. We yeah. evolved from that. So I think a lot of the, you know, even, you know, you see with the, the whole tea thing, it was stories we told ourselves because we weren't informed or, be, or that we were, uh, the truth wasn't told to us that we didn't understand Every we kind of, perpetuated this. We can't we do, blame do. other people. No, absolutely. We do it to ourselves. And like, um, you know, we, like our parents did it, our grandparents did it. All of us colored people, we know like the great, great grandfather came from Scotland and mm. the, you know, the German we know grand them. auntie. We, they are here. Uh, yeah. We don't know the black people. There must have been black people in our family somewhere down and the line. Cool. You know, we didn't magically appear from the, the loins of the German and the Dutch, like magically mingling. And then this brown baby mm. came out mm. of nowhere. No, mm. no, 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 no. Mm. But we don't hear about those records. Our records were destroyed. Um, people were, you know, the, the lighter skinned child is like, no, it's like, you know, hold him up to the sun. Yeah, you can see this. The eyes is almost green around the sides. And you know, the, white, like the lighter skin. Maybe he can pass for white. Maybe she can pass for white. And that's something that still continues to the day. Like, yo, fuck, maybe I can pass for white and then I can get a bonus at the call center. Maybe, mm. you know, you go, you go, you, if you can sit mm. in the job interview in Cape Town, who's going to interview you? Mm. Probably a white man, probably a white man. Um, who's going to own the company? And that's the thing that the main thing, the problem that I have with, with, um, BEE mm. is not that it, that it's given a chance to, uh, to black people and color people is that it's so easily exploitable by white people. Um, and it's written in the company profiles of a lot of these white companies where they just like put like a little dash of like chocolate on the cake and hey, we be compliant, you know? Um, so there's, there, there's a coming back to the, the, how we, our identity and how we sort of almost, um, th- there's a suppression, a self suppression, an auto suppression of, mm. of our identity. Mm. Because it makes economic sense, it, it made uh, in the past. It makes cultural sense, mm. even now. Um, if you want to live and work and play on that side of the railway line, I you, you, you know, you, you, you can't talk like this. And, mm. uh, you, you can't. You have to speak like this. Yeah. And the thing is, when I go back to Strandfontein and I talk a little bit like this, and uh, look here now, I'm trying, trying to, I'm putting it on a bit. 
but you would you will hear it sometimes like when I go deeper into conversation with you and it's not so formal, you'll hear it come out a bit. It's not and like I'm putting it on, it's just when I went to school and when I was in a space where I was taught to be intellectual, then the accent changes and this is how I spoke. So it's also been embedded. I don't choose this as well. You have to understand that that's something that you don't, the code switching, that's what it's called. Mm. Um, it's not something that you do. It's a, you do it as a, as something that you have to get along in, in the majority. Of, mm. If there was one white bra in like the circle, you wouldn't code switch, but like you fitting into white society, which is still the majority of like dealing with the, in terms of the power structures in Cape Town, then you code switch because you do it. It's not something that you do to yourself. It's something that is his, historically inflicted embedded. on you. Mm. It's inflicted on you. Mm. Embedded as well? Yes, but. You have embedded is a is a passive thing. Mm. To have something inflicted on you is a force of violence. Mm. That's like that comes back from when they were pulling their teeth out with like mm. the rusty mm. iron implements mm. to um, people at the slave lodge mm. and around Cape Town. Mm. That's that's an infliction. Mm. It's a mm. it's a it's a taking. Mm. Very deep, and I'm also starting to feel a bit of emotion now, but that's okay as well. We are going to end off soon, but you know, just before we go, I have to bring up this topic as well because it's something close to my heart. And you know, when we use the term colored as well, we use it a lot, but you know, we are when you talk about socialism, social people, koi koi, the people's people. And if you look at the system as well, and what you described, not the ideology necessarily of uh, socialism, but just the behavior, the feeling, the, you know, this is what's for the people, putting people first in a sense. Do you feel that because also we lost our identity, that we can find socialism through finding ourselves by going back to our roots and culture, which is our indigeneity? Very loaded question again, no, but you know. That's, that's an amazing question, actually, because, you know, like how um, culturally it's very important. You look at like how... Uh, important um, cultural culture and traditions are to um, the the Zulu, the Kosa, like all the other tribes that that uh, in South Africa that have um, uh, have have a story, have have a, a cogent story that's been passed down through the uh, oral generation uh, to to oral um, oral tradition, um, and we we don't we don't we don't have that, you know, and it's possible to be. Colored. When I write, mm. I write so called colored. You know, when, when I speak, I'm speaking like mm. as a point of reference in, informally. You know, yeah. Because I think it's so called colored. You know, like um, I don't, I don't. Again, it's like you, colored is a. Uh, it's a very difficult term. I mean, there's I can go on about that for hours. So it's a topic on its own. Yeah, mm. exactly. Um, but um, when we talk about like our our, our culture, you know, like the, the inheritance of loss. There needs to be some kind of reparations. Uh, there needs to be not that other people give to us, but like a, a thing that we do for ourselves. Reclaiming. Yes, um, but can culturally uh, through our identity, uh, I, through uh, some form of consensus around identity. That consensus has to be about like okay, like we we be going now action, mm. you know, and that um, struggle against uh, division among the classes the person you know that 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 colored brother did well and now lives in the, on the other side of the railway line you know mm. um as opposed to you know that um the, the, the colored single woman who like stays by her own like struggling against like gbv and poverty and you know just mm. the, the the oppression of like this mm. position conscious be that. that we need to look at things like socialism um addresses these issues from a, a class basis so when you speak about class, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are a poor white person who's dispossessed by um, whatever historically dispossessed by something that was done to his family or like a black person. The, it, it, it doesn't erase identities. I think it, it's, 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 it would be um, too much to just erase history and identities which played such an important role in determining our present. Mm. Um, even though race is a construct in, mm. in many ways, it's a thing that's kind of made up. We, we humans, you know, but socialism looks at a, a solution for classes of people mm. at the working class, at the impoverished class of people that mm. need to see all the people want is to see that their, their children doing better 
than they did for themselves. And mm. so they scaffold a better future for mm. the generation that comes after them. Mm. Unfortunately, at this stage, we're seeing our children do worse than us. And that's not just in the poorer class. I think also uh, I have a lot of white friends and I think they're also going through in a sense something similar. It's that their parents were better off than in a sense they are today. So I think, you know, as a collective, we need to wake up. Um, we need to work together. We need to embrace our differences. And actually, you know, wherever I went in the world where I met other South Africans, we did well. Mm. And when we came together, people could see this is a group of South Africans that came together. And although we were Afrikaans and colored and black, when we came together, we sounded the same. We had the same gears. Mm. I think there's a lot to embrace in this country. So to just to end off, do you have a quote or a message of inspiration or just something that you'd like to share just to inspire the people and just to send them off with a nice, you know, a little prayer sure, or bedtime, yeah. a bedtime story <laughs> um, on the spot, then? Yeah, something from the heart, man, you know, it doesn't even have to be just something from the heart. If, there, if, if, if there's only one, if there's one thing that I would actually, that one person can do, and I will try and be conscious of this through my day tomorrow, mm. count the number of times you code switch. And then ask yourself, like, yo, why, why did I do that? Mm. Just, just be aware of the, of how many times you feel it necessary to look. It's not, it's not an inspirational thing, but mm. like, uh, it's just a, a thought that hit mm. me that like, what, what I think I'm going to do tomorrow. Mm. Um, and I would like somebody to join me in, in doing that. Mm. So just go a little bit deeper into that with regards to the code switching. So for example, I'm at home and I live in Musenberg. Um, you you're going to go to the shop, you're going you're gonna to buy a bre bread and milk, you're going to say thank you, you're going to say like, um, or you're going to say hi, you're going to say away. Okay. Um, but are you going to speak in a colored accent or are you going to speak in, in your, your white accent? But say, 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 I go to Strandfontein, I'm going to say away. Exactly. But say I'm in Musenberg, then I'm going to say, hey, what's up? Or, yeah. Okay. So I've got, I've, got the, I've got the plumber coming tomorrow, I'm going to, you know, he's, <laughs> he's a white guy. Mm. Um, I know I'm going to code switch. I know. And I know it will be a subconscious thing. Mm. Mm. But why? Why am I doing that? Mm. Why, are we, why are we doing that, mm. actually? Mm. So it's not necessarily about if I should, the one is right and the one is wrong. It's just it's that about right in wrong. the code switching, what is the mentality? What led me to that decision? To having, having scars. Can I say something? Yes. What if you say a way to somebody that you feel more closer to? Then you like your your brethren. You're like like mm. I can say away to you because yeah. there's there's a, there's a, there's a connection there. But with a person of a different color, you won't say that. Or you won't say it not because you want to coach, which maybe, but maybe you just don't feel that that closeness to him. Yeah, mm. could mm. that be maybe? And, that and, coach and, it's, and, it's, and it's, for me, that version is less sinister mm. in a sense. Not sinister. You know what? Get what I'm yes. trying to say. It's less negative, really. Mm. If you think about it. Mm. In in the sense that if you are, are sitting, if, if you are, um, let's say for example, if you're a smoker and there's a bunch of white people outside the outside the building and you need a light and you don't know them, you're never gonna say I wear. You can say excuse me. It's like oh, you're gonna cough curtsy, you know, yeah. like almost. Yeah. 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 In Musenberg, though, bro, it's the opposite. It could even come across as cult <laughs> cultural expropriation because I'll be at like Tiger's Milk, or I'll be I don't go there anymore, but sometimes I do. Um, it's called the Striped Horse. It's like a little bar there. Oh yeah, I know. And that. then you get the oat come out. Are we Brie? Oh, that's my yeah, word. So that's my word. <laughs> white guy with dreadlocks. Oh, yeah, massacre. You know, like, you know, those guys. Yeah, well, Musenberg is a different planet. Musenberg is a whole yeah. different ballgame, yeah. Roscoe Palm, it was a pleasure having you. I had a liquor time chatting. Um, it felt, I mean, we went over an hour and we really do so. Super interesting, and I'm very keen to, to have you on the show again. Nansel? Before we go, I would like you to just to read out this uh, few messages. Yes. Let's holler at the peeps that's online. Okay. So we have Bospero saying, hi, hi, Bospero. What's up, my brother? From another mother. And then we have Tumelo Kuwena. She was on the show. Sister Tumi, Molweni. Politics is out of fashion. INC have turned South Africa into their business. So I think they must appoint a CEO, not the president. Okay. I would like to mail it to, to uh, get in touch with me. That's an interesting thing, but that's uh, yeah. that's a terrible idea. 
I'll tell you why it's a terrible idea. You look at the, the CEOs that are appointed. Spa are going through a terrible thing, uh, mm. corruption, with the CEO um, uh, doing, doing uh, engaged in propriety. You have ABB, which is the Dutch company, which has just been fined for... Um, we think about corruption as being an ANC thing. Corruption needs a corrupted and a corrupter. Okay. So Send the receiver. Yeah, so like the, the Dutch company is, is coming and paid bribes. You know, we should be hardline and say to the Dutch government, like, your guys, we, we'll deal with our guys. We'll put them in prison. But as far as your guys are corrupted, no Dutch company is going to do business in South Africa if for you, the next five years. Yeah. Fuck you. End yeah. of story. Yeah. 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 So. Now I got you loud and clear. So, yeah, we'll... And think, when you, when you go home, think of some more topics for us, no? And bring your inspiration. No, you inspire me. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm just, yeah, it's like I've got the, the stand of the, stand of the enterprise. You know? it's, it's so weird as well that well, this is the conversations that we had. It, well, it, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a bit it's slightly more formal now, but there were some nights where we sat by the wall and we chatted like this deep and intensely and now we're doing it in a, in a studio it's basically like the wall is there yeah, again it's, it's like yeah. the old days yeah. yeah so it's definitely something also spiritual about life life is a spiritual journey mm. uh, it's, you can meet on your on, on, the, on the stoop in the retreat and then one day you're in a studio and who knows where we are next I mean we've both been on, on up big media platforms uh, we're both exposing ourselves and we're wanting more in life and we're wanting to serve most importantly so yeah man I just I wish you well brother and um, thank you for everyone uh, thank you to everyone for tuning in. Um, you guys could have been watching uh, Argentina versus... Who's Argentina playing now? Croatia. Nando? Croatia, yeah. Let's hope Croatia won. Uh, uh, please, no spoiler alert, guys. I'm going to go watch it at home now. I'm teasing. Yeah. And we'll see each other next week. Uh, who, so so yes. who are these people that are like watching us instead of the Argentina game? I don't know. That's you guys amazing. Are, like, oh, <laughs> listening to us. Yeah. Yeah, no. You guys are no life. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> quiet, actually. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, guys. We are out.